Our scripture passage for today is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, beginning at the 22nd verse. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side of the lake while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You ever been caught in a storm? I like a good storm. Watching the gray clouds move across the sky, hearing the wind pick up, seeing the rain fall, watching the flashes of lightning and hearing the thunder. I like a good storm. Of course, that is from a safe viewing point. Maybe the security of my front porch or back deck or just watching the commotion safely through an open door or window. Normally, about this time of year, Sally and I would be planning on heading up to Lakeside to attend the East Ohio Annual Conference. For over 36 years, that's where we've spent the third week of June each year. This year, due to the virus, the Annual Conference has been rescheduled for a partial weekend in late September. I'll miss the opportunity of going up to Lakeside. I'll miss the opportunity of being able to look out over the lake and watch the waves and hear the wind. It's one thing to look out over the lake on a beautiful clear day with a blue sky when the water is calm. It's another thing entirely to see the lake in a storm with the wind pushing the waves about, crashing into the shore, and sometimes washing up over the pier. I like watching a good storm from a safe setting. But a storm takes on a whole different perspective if you're out on the water in the midst of it. Any of you fishermen, anyone a boater, maybe you've discovered what I have. When you're out on the lake and a storm kicks up, the size and security of your boat shrinks. The bigger the storm, the stronger the wind, the rougher the waves, it seems, the smaller your boat becomes. I'm not sure of the precise name for this scientific phenomena that I've experienced. I think it's called a perspective. Throw in a little thunder and lightning, and that big, well-equipped boat that you're so proud of, that you traveled out in, can suddenly feel like a tiny little dinghy being tossed about. Some of you may have watched the television show Deadliest Catch, in which Alaskan crab fishermen battle the weather and sea and risk their lives in pursuit of the rewards of harvesting crab, which they can sell for high dollars on the open market. Those ships that look so big and snug in the harbor can get tossed around like a cork in the stormy waters of the Bering Sea. I like a good storm. From the safe and secure vantage point of my home, firmly anchored on dry land. At least four of Jesus' disciples had formerly been fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, Simon, Andrew, James, and John. 
They were well acquainted with the dangers of stormy weather when you were in a little wooden boat on the Sea of Galilee. In all our day, we have all sorts of safety features when we go out on the water. We can check the weather radio beforehand and know what the conditions are. We can have a GPS, electric lights, bilge pumps, life vests, flotation devices, gas and electric motors, and so on. A while back, a friend of mine who does quite a bit of fishing showed me something he picked up for his fishing excursions. It looked to be just a simple vest that you wear. It didn't look like much. But if you happen to fall into the water, the vest had sensors, and when the vest got overly wet, a little canister would discharge, and it automatically inflated the vest to keep you afloat. I'm not sure what happened to the vest if you got caught simply in a heavy rain. At the time of our gospel account, there were no such safety features. And these men were in a tiny wooden boat. How tiny? Well, back in 1986, a couple of brothers walking the shore of Galilee during a dry season came upon the remains of a wooden boat, the keel and the ribs. The, that boat was 27 feet long, seven and a half feet wide with a maximum depth of about four and a half feet. And they dated that boat back to the era of Jesus. That boat apparently represents the largest boat type in use on the Sea of Galilee in that era. It would have served primarily for fishing. Imagine 27 feet long, less than eight feet wide, out in the middle of the lake. The boats were fairly crude. They were powered by a simple sail or pushing with a long pole or possibly with oars. And the Sea of Galilee is about 13 miles long and eight miles wide at its widest point with an average depth of 84 feet. It's really just a fairly sized lake by world standards, but it's known for its ability to kick up quickly and violently in a storm. Perhaps that's why most of the fishermen in that day preferred to fish close to the shore, not out in the depths. And yet in our passage, we're told that immediately after Jesus feeds the 5,000 miraculously, he made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him back to the other side of the sea while he dismissed the crowd. They've all had a long day. It's getting dark. And Jesus loads all of his disciples into the boat and says something like, you fellows go on back across the lake. I'll stay here and dismiss the crowds and I'll catch up with you later. Can you imagine trying to row a 27 foot long, seven foot wide boat with 12 men on board at night for eight miles across the dark lake with no street lights, no city lights, along the shore to use as a vantage point. And then, while you're out on the lake, in the darkness, trying to keep your bearings and direction, the wind shifts and turns against you. And the waves start whipping up and breaking over the boat. No doubt, some of the disciples were put to work bailing while others tried to keep the boat's nose into the waves. They were being tossed about, up and down, wind and waves battering them around. They were nearly swamped. Meanwhile, where's Jesus? After all, it was his idea for them to get in the boat and head out across the lake in the first place. All they know is that he's somewhere back there, safe and sound on the solid shore. Here are the disciples bailing and rowing for all their worth in the darkness. And Jesus, well, Matthew lets us know what the disciples didn't know, that having sent the crowds away, Jesus has gone up on the mountainside to pray. But he's not oblivious to their situation. The other gospel records of the same passions tell us that he saw their struggle. We're told that during the fourth watch of the night, that's the Roman way of reckoning, that would be somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m., Jesus, aware of their struggles, set out to join them. 
He doesn't jump into a Coast Guard cutter. He doesn't commandeer a helicopter. He doesn't hop on a jet ski. He simply begins to walk out to them one step at a time on the surface of the water. He leaves the security of the dry ground to go to his weary, waterlogged, and frightened disciples. And when his disciples see him approaching, rather than feeling relieved, Matthew records, well, they're terrified. See, we understand that popular Jewish superstition of that era was that the appearance of spirits at night brought disaster. And the disciples' terror was prompted but that they probably thought he was a water spirit of some sort. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I, or rather, I am. Don't be afraid. And then Peter speaks up. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Now I wonder, is Peter merely wanting to experience what Jesus is experiencing? Or in the midst of the false storm, is it possible that he feels safe, safer close to Jesus rather than being in a rickety old boat? Jesus doesn't question Peter's motives. He just tells him, come on. And so Peter steps out of the boat. Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. And if the passage ended there, we'd be impressed, as would have all the disciples. But there's more. It says, when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said, You of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, Peter overcame his fears long enough to step out in faith, to get out of the boat in response to Jesus' call. But it's when he took his eyes off of Jesus, it's when he focused on the waves lashing about him, when he felt the strength of the wind against his face. When he gave in to his fears and doubts, he began to sink. But even then, he knew who to cry out to. He said, Lord, save me. And Jesus did. He reached out his hand and caught him up and kept him from going under and just asked a simple question. Such little faith, why did you doubt? And then together they climbed into the boat with the other awe-stricken 11 disciples. Matthew tells us that when they did, the wind died down. And those in the boat worshipped Jesus. And they said, truly you are the Son of God. That's the first time the disciples had used this title in addressing Jesus. Like I said earlier, I like a good storm when I can view it from a safe setting. But when you commit to following Jesus, he never promises there won't be any storms. He never tells us to focus on playing it safe. Instead, he calls us to focus on being obedient to his call. He sent them the boat and they went. He asked Peter to come and Peter stepped out of the boat. In obedience to his call, when the sun was about to set, the disciples had climbed into that little wooden boat and set out for another shore. Wonder, when have you stepped out in faith in response to Christ's call? What have you had to leave behind? And what have you had to take up? You know, we might prefer to stay safely on the shore, and yet Jesus calls us to step out. Just a couple of points I'd like to reflect on as we consider this passage. One is, sometimes you have to get out of the boat. No pain, no gain. No risk, no reward. Somebody said a ship in a harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. Most of us want to stay safely planted on the shore or stay safely in the boat. God calls us to step out and move beyond to leave behind our safe and secure comfort zones when we prefer to stay right where we are. 
What have you risked in following Jesus? When you decide to live for and follow him, don't be surprised at the storms. That's our second point. Don't be surprised at the storms. Storms come in everyone's lives. Whatever made us think that if we're going to follow Jesus, it would all be smooth sailing. As I heard a southern preacher once say, downhill with the breeze, all honey, no bees. In John 16, Jesus says these words to his disciples prior to his crucifixion. I told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In 1 Peter 4.12 we read, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. How many times is that not our first response when we face a crisis, when we find ourselves in a difficult situation? Why is this happening to me? Don't be surprised by the storms. And lastly, one observation is that we have to decide if we'll live based on fear or faith. Yes, we will face storms in our lives. Yes, our little boats seem frail. But we don't face the storms alone. And all storms ultimately pass. Psalm 46, 7 says, The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You're not alone. If your heart and life belong to Christ, he promises to always be with you, to never leave or forsake you. If the Lord of the wind and waves, the creator, sustainer, redeemer, and king is with you, why do we fear? Why do we doubt? We can weather the storms if we know we're in a safe place, like me liking to watch a good storm as long as I know I'm secure. The safest place in the storm is close to Jesus. In Psalm 25, we read, you have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy and their distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. Verse 9 says, In that day they will say, Surely this is our God, we trusted him and he saved us. This is the Lord, we trusted in him, let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Isaiah 41. And verse 8 says, But you, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, You are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You may have never heard the name of Charles Albert Tindley. Let me tell you just a little bit about this gentleman. He was born in Maryland, July 7, 1851, son of Charles and Hester Tindley. His father was a slave. His mother was free. His mother died when he was very young, and he was taken in by his mother's sister in order to keep him free. It seems that he was expected to work to help the family, and he was hired out as a young boy wherever his, he could be placed to earn some income. When he was 17 years old, he married. Together, he and his wife had eight children, some of whom would later assist him in his publication of hymns. He was largely self-taught. He learned to read mostly on his own. And he moved to Philadelphia in 1875, and he took correspondence courses toward becoming a Methodist minister. He did this while working as a caretaker for a building, a sexton, at the East Bainbridge Street Church. Beginning, beginning in 1885, he was appointed by the bishop to serve two or three year terms at a series of churches until coming full circle to become a pastor at East Bainbridge in 1902. 
Under his leadership, that church grew, and that church relocated in 1904 to a, to a larger facility to be able to accommodate the numbers. His life was not easy. It was difficult. And he went through a number of trials. But he wrote a hymn that we still sing today. Let me read some of the words to that hymn to you. See if they don't ring true. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the hosts of hell assail and my strength begins to fail, thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. When I do the best I can and my friends misunderstand, Thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. In the midst of persecution, stand by me. In the midst of persecution, stand by me. When my foes in battle array undertake to stop my way, those who save Paul and Silas, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When my life becomes a burden and I'm nearing chilly Jordan, O oh, thou lily of the valley, stand by me. Feeling caught up in the storm? Can't wait for the clouds to part and the storm to cease and the water become calm again. It, it may be a while, friends. But the Lord of wind and water walks with us. May our prayer be when the storms of life are raging, Lord, stand by me.